Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the podcast. And this week we are continuing with our look behind the scenes of Madden America for our 200th podcast. Madden America got started in January 2012, and so to celebrate a decade of critical comment and appraisal, we thought it would be interesting to reflect on Madden America's mission and work by speaking to the people behind the scenes who keep it running day to day. And before we move on to our interviews, I just want to pay tribute to the people at MIA who couldn't join us for these interviews for one reason or another. Susanna Sinercia is our assistant editor, and amongst other things, she manages our Around the Web section, and she's always finding interesting articles from the corners of the internet that help to tell of a shift in thinking about mental health. Also, of course, Madden America relies heavily on the science news team, as we discussed in part one of this podcast. And for overview, we have our board consisting of Robert Whitaker, Kermit Cole, Louisa Putnam, Olga Runciman and Claudia Esteve. I also want to thank you all for listening and to say that if you want to support Madden America in its ongoing mission, then you can donate by visiting maddenamerica.com and clicking the donate button in the top right hand corner. We know that not everyone is in a position to donate, so you can also help us by visiting MIA regularly, signing up for our weekly newsletter, and sharing our content on social media. So, on to our interviews, and later we'll hear from blogs editor Peter Simons, personal stories editor Emmeline Mead, community moderator Steve McCree, and family resources editor Miranda Spencer. First, though, we hear from coordinator of our continuing education webinars, Karina Ruggiero. Karina tells of her journey off psychiatric drugs and to finding Mad in America, and how we are reinvigorating our continuing education efforts. Karina, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today for this um, 200th episode of the Madden America podcast and um, really, really pleased to have you on. So kind of to get us going, I, I wanted to start off by asking a little bit, if it's okay, about you and your journey. So, you know, how, what was it in your life that kind of brought you to Madden America in the first place? Yeah, thanks for having me, James. Um, so the background story is started when I was a kid. Um, from about the ages 9 to 13, I had several deaths in my family, um, or actually family and, and friend circle, rather. And then my mother got brain cancer. And um, during this time, I was experiencing uh, panic attacks, and nobody knew what they were. It seemed like a medical problem, because now the term panic attack is very ubiquitous. But at the time, really nobody, it, it was very rare to, to know what that was. Yeah, I was going to doctors. It, I was doing all these tests. And... Um, what happened was in the end, they said they diagnosed me with a panic disorder. And unfortunately, the way that it was told to me was that this was a chemical imbalance in my brain, which we all now uh, know now is not true. And it's very, very disempowering. So I'm this 13 year old that gets diagnosed with a chemical imbalance. And they tell me the fix is to take a pill to correct the the chemical imbalance. And um, so that's what I did. And I went on to live a very quote unquote normal life, you know, career, friends, marriage, all that good stuff. Um, but something always felt not right to me. So I ended up staying on this medication for 22 years of my life. I was always like, I felt like I didn't need it. So I would just try to get off of it. You know, I'd taper off, like the doctor said, but I would go into withdraw every time that I would try to get off of it. And, and the very unfortunate part about that was I didn't know it was withdraw. So then I would go to the doctor and the doctors would tell me, you need the medication. <laughs> so I stayed on for 22 years. And I started when I was 20 years old. So about you know, 17 years ago, I started meditating because I was searching still. Like something just like wasn't right for me. So I started to go on this kind of soul search. And I went off and on that path for a long time. You know, I would go through periods where I'd meditate and do yoga and all this stuff. And 
I gained a lot from it. But in the last few years, I started to get really deep into it. And I had some very profound, um, very profound spiritual experiences. And I knew, like, I always, like, my greatest thing that I wanted to do was get off this medication. I just hated being dependent on it. When I was trying to get off the medication before, I had searched the internet. Like, I had searched and searched and searched for stories of people who had been on. And I could never find success stories. So anyway, back to this, this spiritual experience. Like, in my soul, it's probably one of the most powerful decisions, if not the most. If I, it is the most powerful decision. Whereas, like, I do not care if one person on this earth has not gotten off of this. I am going to do it. I am going to do it. And um, surprisingly, after that, I actually found um, a lot of stories and information that I needed. So I found people who had had it much worse than me, who had come out triumphantly on the other side, like Laura Delano, Will Hall, um, Baylissa Frederick, Michael Preby, Ali Zek, Greer Adams, like all these amazing stories. So I went ahead, I tapered off over a six month period, which now I know is way too fast for anybody listening. And I went into a severe and protracted withdrawal that I was not prepared for. But I did it. And now I'm on the other side. And I will just say, that the other side is so beautiful, so much fuller, and I'm so much happier than I ever was on the medication, know myself so much better. And um, for anybody going through withdrawal right now, it is hell on earth. It is horrific. Like, I don't even have words to describe, you know, if you're going through it. But I just want to reassure you that uh, I believe that everybody heals and some people get off easy. They don't even go through withdrawal. Sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it's in between. But I do believe everybody heals. And there's so much beauty, so much beauty on the other side. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, firstly, you know, I, I think we're incredibly fortunate to have you with us in uh, at Mad in America. And you, you do so much for us, which we'll, we'll come on to talk about. But before we get there, you know, what an incredibly frightening experience for a young girl to have at 13 to see illness within the family and then then to be made to believe by doctors that there was something wrong with you on top of that that must have been such a confusing mix of emotions for you but I, I, I to get off the drugs after 22 years I don't think many people out there who haven't experienced it themselves really know the challenge that that presents so I, I Karina I'm so glad that you made it through that period. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Yeah, I, I feel very lucky to have done that. <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit about the kind of things that you do with Mad in America? Yeah. So my background is in business operations, and I do various uh, operational, admin, HR um, pieces. But the main thing I focus on at Mad in America is um, our live on it live online events and our continuing education events um, or continuing education efforts, I should say. Um, and I do those in partnership with Kermit Cole, who's uh, one of our founding board uh, members, and he's also our new director of continuing education. Um, I think the best way to describe it maybe is if I bucket it out into kind of two categories. So we have our continuing education um, program. And that was developed way before my time um, as a way to get a lot of the science around mental health that is not so well known out into the public, particularly through like the target audience for continuing education is um, professional groups, mental health professionals. Although we also have a lot of survivors and members of the general public that use these courses as well. But there's so much science that is not in the system, the mental health system yet. Yeah. And there's also like this public narrative that is not matching up with the science. So the continuing education program was really meant to get more of that out. Um, and we'll have various like leading uh, practitioners uh, researchers, uh, professors, uh, mental health professionals that will present um, on various topics. And they all support 
our mission that we really need a shift in the current paradigm of mental health care. Because right now it's so focused on medicating and especially medicating for the long term. So we have that. And then we also do online events, um, which sometimes we refer to as like town halls. And those are more community based. They're more discussion based. Um, often we'll do panels. Sometimes we'll film. Uh, we'll do a film screening. Um, talk about it, different initiatives. So we have those, and like overall, what Kermit and I will do is we'll pick whatever we feel is relevant. Um, we aim for one every month or couple months, um, and then we'll work with the presenters on like the format, the questions, the points to hit. And then I'll also do all the coordinating behind the scenes. So make uh, the marketing, the logistics, uh, and just make sure everything is running smoothly. You know, Karina, I'm really excited to see the continuing education part of Madden America get up and running again after it, it took a bit of a hiatus. It used to be looked after by Bob Nickel, but I'm so pleased that you and Kermit are re-enlivening it again because educating about change is you know one of the most powerful tools for changing the paradigm isn't it to to bring to people's attention that there is a different way of looking at mental health that there, there are different approaches that are successful and you know I, I was particularly struck by um i think the last event was um uh, an interview with sir robin murray who you know is uh, one of the world's most cited researchers in psychosis type experiences and you know for for him to come and you know present at Madden America uh, you know that that was pretty special really because he did reflect upon mistakes he'd made in his career and things that he wished he'd done differently so I think continuing education is an incredibly powerful tool for stimulating the the, the conversation about change isn't it yeah and you know as you were talking I thought of one other thing I think why it's so important too is because a lot of the continuing education programs are indirectly funded by pharmaceutical companies. And so they're very skewed. And so we um, set this up, we before my time, set this up to uh, really show a different perspective. So Karina, you know, given your kind of personal experiences of, you know, your diagnosis and, you know, the treatment that you had for 22 years and getting off the drugs and then discovering Madden America and these various other communities, you know, I, I wondered if you're thinking about mental health has changed, you know, through those experiences. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's been a whole process, but from the time I was 13 to now, what I can say at the highest level is... I believed at 13 years old, I had a brain dysfunction that needed to be corrected by a medication and that I would have to live with my whole life. Um, so I went from that to a completely different view now where I don't believe that uh, anxiety and depression are a chemical imbalance in the brain. I believe, I now trust my emotions. Back then, I... I thought, okay, I need to, to manage away all my negative emotions and chase the good, the good ones. Now I have a deep, deep respect for the full spectrum of emotions. I trust them. They have wisdom and they're pointing me in a certain direction. They're, they're like my inner compass telling me something. Um, and I don't want to make a Blaken statement that medication is never helpful because I know people who have found it to be helpful, but it is not curing a chemical imbalance. And we need to have informed consent and be aware of the risk. So I went essentially from this model of dysfunction to something much more empowering. And, and Karina, you know, when we were talking before this interview, you, you mentioned that um, attending an organized retreat had been important in your recovery. So is that something we can talk about? Yeah, absolutely. I love talking about this because it, it really changed my life. So the retreat is called Path of Love. And I participated in it twice. And I actually just got back from working at it. And it is amazing. I don't even have words for it. But it was so key in my healing journey. So first of all, when you go to this retreat, I have never experienced so much 
like love, powerful love in one place. Um, and there's so many people there. They're searching for something. A lot of them have been through really traumatic experiences. Some are just not happy with the, the way their life is going. They're just looking for deeper meaning in their life. And it's a process. It's a seven-day process. It's not like in your head talk therapy. You're doing a lot of the processing through your body. And um, there's trained therapists there that will be like, okay, what do you feel in your body? What kind of emotions are you feeling? You'll, you'll role play. You'll physically act out things. Um, it's amazing to watch because a lot of people will actually have like physical releases where their body will start trembling, muscle spasms, all these kind of things. Just having worked there, watching the people walk in at the beginning and who they are and at the end of the seven days, it's phenomenal. The, the way the person looks is different. Their body, the way they hold themselves, their voice, everything has changed. I just, it's almost unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. So it really helps me in my process. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that, Karina. And, you know, I, I think um, the power of communities is is perhaps one of the most important things in so many people's recoveries, isn't it? And, you know, I, I kind of like to think that Madden America for some people, maybe not for all, but for some people does provide some of that community. And I hope that in some way it, it kind of can help people to, you know, come to terms with some pretty horrific experiences and hopefully some healing can come from that. I absolutely agree. Yes, community is one of the keystones for healing and Madden America does provide that. I just I really respect so greatly that the organization is about seeking truth and listening to all sides. Um, there's no like cancel culture here. Uh, we really like Bob has set the tone to invite all parties in and have discussions uh, so we can come to some kind of shared uh, understanding. Uh, so I appreciate that, appreciate that and love working with colleagues like you, James. Well, thank you so much, Karina. I, I think we're incredibly lucky to have you on the team. And, you know, I, I'm so glad that you could find some time to, to join me today and uh, we're happy to share some experiences. So thank you so much. Thank you, James. Next, we hear from Peter Simons. Peter is our blogs editor and science writer. He talks of his dissatisfaction with the story of settled science that he encountered as a postgraduate psychology student. Peter, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me for this 200th episode of the podcast, which, uh, you know, is pretty special, I think, for MIA. And so, you know, to kind of get us un underway, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how it was you came to know about and to join Madden America in the first place. Well, I came to MIA, I think, through the sort of academic route and through a sort of research route. You know, I studied counseling psychology. I have a master's degree in it. I worked as a therapist trainee for many years and did three years of a PhD in it, um, published research in the field. Um, and, and what I ran into is I just kept running into situations which sort of really contradicted the, the story that we were told. You know, I, I went into the field because I believed in it, you know. And then basically every, every situation I was in contradicted the, the mainstream sort of story of what what happens to people why people are in distress and and what psychology and psychiatry can do to help you know so you know i was i was doing a lot of sort of searching for it for an explanation of why do i keep running into these situations that sort of defy the expectation that i had when i went into this field um and i think a lot of people uh you only see what matches your expectations but i'm just like i'm the sort of person and this is my this is my failing and it's also uh, you know it's my heroic flaws <laughs> it's a it's a failing in that it makes my life a lot more difficult sometimes but it's also something that i like about myself which is that i just never stop asking questions and uh sometimes that undermines the assumptions that i based my entire life on and this is one of those times where you know i went into this field to to make it my purpose in life you know to to become a a psychologist and help people using 
the sort of like mainstream understanding of psychology. Um, but I couldn't stop asking questions, you know, and eventually I asked enough questions that the whole assumption that the field is based on sort of broke open for me. So I think for me, it was, it was sort of, okay. So that was part of, part of doing research is trying to figure out like, what is, what is actually going on here? So that's how I ended up doing a lot of sort of critical psychiatry stuff, um, particularly in my doctoral program. And that led me sort of directly to Mad in America. I read uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic first, and it was the first time that I had seen somebody make a coherent argument for anything, really, in, in psychology. And it just happened to be a critical argument. Um but, you know, juxtapose that against all of my classes, which were just like this extremely surface level argument where as soon as you asked a question about it, the whole thing fell apart, you know. And then I read Bob's book and, I, and it was an argument where if you asked a question, you got an answer. You know, that was the, the big step for me was finding <laughs> any sort of argument that actually made sense. And it, and it happened to be in anatomy of an epidemic. Um, so that led me to Bob and to, to Mad in America. My main focuses are in trying to like, I always want to find that argument. Like what is the argument that makes sense? And what is the argument where when people ask you a question, you actually have an answer to it. As a researcher, as like a science writer, I am trying to ask those questions, which I think is, is something that doesn't happen in journalism for some reason, you know, in, in science journalism, it's just taking at face value, whatever is in the, not even, not even in the data of a study, but what it, whatever is in the abstract of a study or whatever the researcher about this study tells you, you know, no, no digging into it at all. And I think a good example of that is, uh, you know, I wrote a, an article recently called the serotonin zombie about this study that purports to to bring back the the low serotonin hypothesis of depression but as soon as you as soon as you read any of their data it's just not there um so i mean it was appalling to me that this was presented in the guardian with quotes from these authors as if it's like this groundbreaking thing that found low serotonin and i i you know, I always go into this and I'm like, oh, really? Like, wow, that would be great. Like, please restore my faith in this. <laughs> like, bring me back to like the point where this was my purpose in life and I was going to be a psychologist. Like, if that would, if that could happen, that would be great <laughs> just to have all the answers. And, <laughs> uh, but no, you know, I looked into the data and, and they had three hypotheses. One of them was do people with depression have low serotonin? The answer was no. Like, there was no difference. Then another hypothesis was, is it based on severity of depression? Like people with extremely severe depression have low serotonin. The answer was no. Again, like they, they did these tests and found, no, that wasn't true. And then there's like a third hypothesis that's like, what happens if we dose people with this drug? Like, how does their serotonin respond? And even that, the data was bad. You know, this tiny study where there's one outlier driving the statistics but it's like, that's not even what we care about. Who cares how somebody responds to being dosed with a weird drug? Like, all we care about is do people with depression have low serotonin or not compared to people without? Like, and, and the study, the data says no. The data says it's the same. Uh, but it's reported on as if this is, you know, some groundbreaking finding of low serotonin. And it's just like, it's just things like that, which are appalling to me that sort of drive me to write about these things for Madden America. And it's things like that, that I kept running into as a, as a doctoral student, I would read these studies and be like, wow, is that how you're reporting that? You know, Peter, thank you. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your role at, at Madden America? You know, you, you said you're a science writer, so can, can you describe kind of how that process works? Yeah, so um, I came to Madden America as a science writer initially, um, and I still do that. I write, uh, I write one science article a week, um, which is, you know, not an opinion piece, but just a, a summary of what a peer-reviewed piece of literature says. Um, but I think the difference between that and science writing that you might see in another publication is that I I look at the data first, you know. Um, which is what you're taught to do in a in a extremely critical doctoral program is to look at the data, read the abstract last, 
you know, because the abstract is just full of spin. So look at the data, draw your own conclusions, and then go and look at the abstract and their conclusion and and see how did they report this. Um, so I think that's the big difference between the science writing that we do, and not just me, but all of our science writers sort of have that perspective, I think, um, versus, you know, science writing in a, a less specialized outlet where the person doing the science writing probably doesn't have the background to even understand the the data. So they have to go by the abstract or go by what the researchers are are telling them. So yeah, I, I really enjoy digging into the the research data and sort of telling that story. Um, and then sort of as uh, as I've worked at Madden America, my area has broadened so that I'm now the also I'm also the editor for blogs. Um, which bring a, a sort of different perspective because they're, they're opinion pieces about, uh, and it sort of expands, you know, from like, okay, here's an individual study with the data, but expands that into what do we do with that? You know, when we, when we see this data coming out, uh, what is, what does that mean for our, for our society, for the, you know, the, the culture of therapy, the culture of psychiatry, the culture of pharmaceutical drugs, and and sort of what do we, you know, how do we how do we reframe our our ideology when when this is what the data actually says? So yeah, I'm also the editor for blogs, and I enjoy sort of letting uh, helping people to tell that story of which has a lot more sort of context, I think. Yeah, the the blogs are hugely important, aren't they? Because as you said, that that that's um, that's where the science meets real world lived experience. You know, that's where you can see the impact of good or bad science actually on the lives of the person who, it, you know, it ultimately ends up as. And surely that's the most important thing: is not getting published in a journal, but actually is this helping the life of a person and individual in the street? Yes, exactly. And so, Peter, you know, I. I um, I do think we're tremendously lucky to have you, you know, particularly with your inquiring and questioning mind, because, you know, that that is exactly what, what needs to be done with this. And, you know, I, I thank you so much for the accessibility that you give to science that might be really, really hard for people to get at otherwise. You know, it might be behind paywalls, it might be in journals that, you know, people can't you know, afford a subscription to or whatever, but not only do you provide a, a gateway to that, you, you know, digest some really, really difficult to understand material and make it palatable for people, which, you know, means that we can all join in that conversation about good and bad science, which is tremendously important, I think, and you do such a good job of it. And and so, you know, I wondered in the time that you've been vo involved in, you know, writing your own pieces, in editing other people's blogs and so forth, you know, has there been a particular piece which really has stuck with you I, I should imagine there's, there's probably many but i wondered if there's a piece that you know particularly you regularly refer people to or you you know really really kind of changed your thinking about things yeah i don't know if there's any any one specific piece um some of the research that i that really sort of changed my perspective on things um you know there was this big article I think it was in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, that looked at published and unpublished trials of antidepressants. That's something I shared to people all the time because there's this idea in sort of the general population that like the FDA wouldn't have approved things if they weren't shown to be effective. For instance, there's this a trust in government institutions, which is a little surprising, but it happens. Um, <laughs> So this this article is a good example of when you look at all of the data, uh, you know, half of the antidepressant trials failed, and the other half show a, a tiny difference above placebo. You know, it's not it's not as if half of them failed and the other half were huge successes either. Um, but that's the surprise because we only hear about the trials that are positive. Those are the ones that get published. So, you know, it also ties into the way that the FDA makes decisions, which is. Uh, I mean, over time, they they require less and less uh, data. So it used to be we need a couple of really good studies showing a positive effect. And also, it doesn't matter how many negative studies there are and how many uh, bad effects there are. But but at least we need a couple of good studies first. But now everything is getting approved through uh, a much faster process, which 
uses proxy outcomes and uses only one study that shows an effect and will use all these other studies that aren't really good RCTs to just, you know, sort of provide context that this totally works. So, I mean, the process is getting is getting worse and worse and it wasn't wasn't good to begin with. So that's something that I share with people a lot. Yeah, I I, I can't I, I can't help but be I'm uh, not surprised anymore because you do become a bit cynical that when you see this stuff so often. But how in so many trials, even when great care has been taken to stack the deck to the positive result, you know, the results still aren't very good and still aren't very positive, even with all of that manipulation. And, you know, it's um, it's bafflement, really, that this, uh, you know, these, these studies get published in a, a blaze of positive publicity, as you say, nice quotes in The Guardian and things like that. But then you come along and look at the data and there's a world of difference between them, isn't there? Uh, one of the studies that um, that I saw early on in my doctoral program, which was a great example of how how studies how the abstract of studies is is spun by the researchers to sort of say what they wanted to say it was a study that compared an antidepressant with St. John's wort and placebo so three different three different drugs one of them a placebo one a sort of natural remedy in St. John's wort and one the antidepressant uh and the abstract for the study says we found that St. John's wort was not effective. It was the same as a placebo. But then you look at, and they don't even mention the fact that there was an antidepressant arm. <laughs> so I was like, uh, huh, <laughs> I see an antidepressant arm, yet that's not reported in your conclusion. So you look at the data and it says, actually, the antidepressant arm did the worst. <laughs> it was antidepressant worst. St. John's wort second worst. Placebo did the best. And it's studies like that that then, you know, don't even make it into the antidepressant literature because, you know, the conclusion doesn't have anything to do with antidepressants. Um, but the data does, you know, the data shows that the antidepressant was terrible, worse than a placebo, you know, so. And so, Peter, um, you know, I, I guess I kind of know the answer to this one already, but you obviously went through a period in your studies where you found that your what you believed about the science wasn't proven when you actually came to look at examples of how it was used. And then you came to Madden America and you, you know, spent a great deal of time writing about similar problems and, you know, mining the data to see whether the conclusions come to were, were reliable or not. So since you've been with Mad at America, has your thinking about the whole mental health industry changed? Or is it really there's just the work you've done has confirmed the kind of, you know, feeling that you got during your studies that things weren't really right? I would say it's it's confirmed it. I think for me the the sort of aspect that I've come to is that I think I think there's a reason that that psychology, psychiatry exist. You know, people are in distress. No one's arguing that people aren't in distress, you know, uh, and people want answers and people, people want to feel better, you know, and I get that for sure. Uh, and that's what led me into the field in the first place. And, and I think that there may even be a, a space for a version of, of therapy, but it's not a science is the problem. You know, I went into it thinking it was going to be a science and that's how it's presented. Uh, but the, the, the the data is just not scientific in any way. So what what there is, I think, is a is a philosophy, and philosophy can be helpful for people. You know, like uh, I think you can you can make changes in your life because you sort of investigate your own ideology and and decide what is meaningful and and look for purpose in your life. You know, um, and I think that if the field of psychology as a sort of therapy field, the field of psychotherapy, I guess. Um, I think if they thought of themselves as a as a philosophy, uh, more like life coaches than like a, a scientific medical field, I think we would all be better off. And I think there's a there's a space for that, and I think it can really help people. But when you present it as a science, people are going to keep questioning it, and. Uh, when you don't have the evidence to back it up, it, it undermines everything that might even be good about the field. Peter, thank you. You know, I, I just want to reiterate how many, many people out there, I think, value the work that you do because you do make impenetrable science available and accessible for people. And if we're going to have a societal discussion about where the science can't 
enable us to discover more about mental health, then surely, you know, we have to bring people into the tent. And your writing does that. Your writing allows people to be part of the conversation. I think we're very, very fortunate to have you. And, you know, I'm very happy to to work alongside you and, and, and see what you come up with, you know, which, that, you know, science should be a journey of discovery, shouldn't it? But for so many years, we've been only allowed to perhaps see science that's predetermined you know it can only be published if it follows a predetermined or pre-agreed story but what i think mad in america and you do so well is to open up that story and say we don't know these things so let's think again so i'm so grateful for all that you do thank you james and now i'm handing over to bob whittaker who spoke with our personal stories editor emmeline mead Emmeline has been with MIA since 2014, and she shares with us some of her experiences over those times. Hello, this is Bob Whitaker, and I'm sitting in for James Moore to do this interview with Emmeline Mead. Emmeline has been with My- Mad in America for many, many years. And so, Emmeline, I, first of all, thanks for being here. How did you first come to Mad in America? I first came to work with Mad in America in 2014. And at the time, I'd been working with a radical mental health peer support organization called the Icarus Project for a number of years, first as a volunteer and later in a paid position. Um, I found out about that project through a therapist I was seeing. They used to produce a lot of stickers and postcards and such. And one of my therapist's other clients just gave her a card that she kind of casually handed to me one day, like, oh, this might interest you. And I like the artwork. So I went to check out the website and they had a web forum that served as a sanctuary for this little community of uh, lost souls and visionaries who are all helping each other through their struggles, sometimes really intense stuff. And I just showed up there like a Prozac poster child with no critique of the mental health system or the illness narrative, no idea that it was something you even could critique. But people in that forum gently challenged my views, and I came to understand that all these things that I'd assumed to be medical fact were actually highly contested social constructs. And you know, it wasn't hard for me to make that leap because I've always been kind of skeptical of authority. Um, also, it was pretty clear to me that I was only depressed because bad things kept happening to me. I had lived through some pretty nightmarish stuff like suicide of a parent, being a foster kid, being homeless after I aged out. And I think to not be depressed would have been crazy. So all the broken brain, chemical imbalance stuff, logically, it just didn't add up for me. I I believed it, but I was never really sold on it. Um, And somewhere in the midst of this, I stopped taking the Prozac, which was the last psych drug I would ever take. I hate to say it, but I didn't taper. It wasn't even a conscious decision to quit, really. I just never got around to refilling the prescription ever again. (laughs) Um, Prozac is kind of infamous for just plopping a new personality down onto a person and That personality might be more cheerful and outgoing and better at functioning in the world, but it's it's not who you really are. And after a while, that disconnect can make you feel like a zombie and you want to die because you're no longer in touch with your own soul. And eventually some subconscious part of me just rebelled and said, enough of this. And so that was that. So that's where I was at when Anatomy of an Epidemic came out. That book opened my eyes in so many ways, but it also confirmed things that I already suspected. Over the years at Icarus, I'd noticed that the people who seemed the most emotionally stable were often people who had left psychiatry behind, whereas the most devoted pill takers often struggled with crisis after crisis. And anatomy gave me a framework for understanding what that might be. You were touring with the book and you did a reading in my town and we met and you signed my copy. And then some years later, I heard you're looking to hire a new moderator for the comments section. And since I had a lot of experience with moderating the Icarus forums, 
I applied and joined the team as community manager. I think there was maybe like three or four of us running the website back then. And then I think it was sometime in 2015, uh, Laura Delano, who was the personal stories editor, left. And I stepped up to take on that work. And later, I also took on the blogs editing when Kermit needed to step back and the weekly newsletter when Justin needed to focus on the research news team. Oh, pretty much. I'd step up to do whatever needed doing that I was capable of doing and eventually found myself in the position of managing editor, which I was pretty proud of. But putting out, you know, five blogs and personal stories a week, every week, plus a newsletter and other tasks by myself for years, ultimately it was just too much. And I wound up needing to take a leave from work um, and other people stepped up to take on my tasks. And then since I came back, I took on a much more sustainable workload. <laughs> and the personal stories are always the closest to my heart. So that's the main thing I do now. So Emmeline, you've spent several years now editing personal stories. And as you know better than anyone, these stories often are filled with a great deal of pain, a great deal of loss, a great deal of trauma. And I just wonder how you as an editor, how does this this collection of stories, how does it, how do you respond emotionally? How does it make you feel, so to speak? Um, well, overall, I'd say the work is pretty fulfilling because, you know, like you pointed out, if you have meaningful work in life, consider yourself blessed. Um, for me, it's really an honor to be able to help people bring their stories to the world. A lot of these authors have dealt with like a lifetime of their reality and their suffering just being dismissed and twisted and misinterpreted. Uh, the entire system of psychiatry is just an elaborate form of gaslighting, really. Um, and so, you know, having their story read by thousands of people might be the first time they were ever really heard and validated, um, especially by a community that understands the struggle. That can be pretty powerful. And it's important to me that. Um, we make sure each story really shines. But there can be a, a darker side to doing this kind of work. You once made a comment about how I probably know more about how psychiatry hurts people than anyone in the world. I don't know if that's true, but I definitely know a lot about it. And the thing is, you can't be so close to so much pain and not be affected by it, you know, not have it leave a mark on you. I think there's a degree of vicarious trauma involved for all of us at MIA, I think. And, you know, there's been stories that I've edited that moved me to tears, that haunted me for weeks. And to work with these stories, you have to be able to feel that and hold that and kind of sit with those shadows and those ghosts and bear witness and honor them. But you also have to take care of business and write emails and get the next story out. You know, it's tough. You have to keep your heart open to do this work, but you also need a thick skin. So Emmeline, you've edited now hundreds of personal stories. And what would you say you've learned from those stories writ large? And what do these stories collectively tell us, the listeners? What do we learn from them? Psychiatry ruins lives, I guess, would be the main theme. Uh, you know, our personal stories archive, it's a, I see it as a, it's a body of evidence, a growing record of all the harm done. Um, but it's also a record of what helped, how people were able to heal and recover. I, it offers both a warning and a source of hope. And one thing I see in the stories is that, uh, like me, people usually had good reasons for any extreme states of mind they were in. And they usually know what those reasons are, not only after the fact when they've had time to reflect on it, but also sometimes while it's happening. Like they'll be dealing with bullying, abuse, poverty, trauma, sleep deprivation, that's a big one, social isolation, racism, sexism, all the other isms, toxic diets and environments and relationships, being scapegoated by their family, that's pretty common. Often a major life change, such as a death in the family or a divorce or a breakup or losing a job. 
is a precipitating factor. Even something generally positive, like leaving home to start college or having a baby. Basically, these emotional states didn't come out of nowhere. They were natural reactions to the struggles of life that might have resolved with time. But once a person's given this hopeless prognosis and a bunch of pills, it all becomes chronic and entrenched. Emline, thanks very much for speaking with me today. It's uh, been really great having you work for Madden America for nine years. You've been such an essential part of Madden America all these times. And as you said, I think you've had practically every job during that time, every position. So let's hope you're with us for another decade looking ahead. And again, thanks for being here today. Thanks, Bob. Next, we hear from Madden America's community moderator, Steve McCree. Steve shares with us how an early experience with therapy led to his interest in alternatives to psychiatric treatment. Steve, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today for this um, little podcast where we look behind the scenes at Mad at America. Sure. And um, to get us underway, um, I wanted to ask a little bit about you. So I believe that you spent time as a psychological therapist. So could you tell us about that and then how you kind of first came to know about Mad at America? Well, actually, I'm going to take you back a little further than that. I will say that I first got interested in therapy when I went to my own therapy in my 20s. And uh, I had a very good therapist. uh, And we looked at childhood issues and current relationships and how I could become more empowered and take charge of my life and that kind of thing. It was a very good experience for about a year and a quarter. And uh, my therapist said, you know, you're kind of a natural at this. You might be a really good therapist. So I ended up sort of having that in my mind. I actually was went into science in college, uh, chemistry. Um, I ended up becoming a teacher after doing some work in the chemical industry and realizing it was incredibly dull. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And then I couldn't find a job teaching. And so I found this job like working at a, teen mom's home that paid like dirt. I was doing the overnight shift at a teen mom's home uh, for like $800 a month. And uh, that got me into the field. And I discovered I was in fact, very good at it. I was pretty, pretty natural at putting people at their ease, getting them to feel safe talking to me, um, you know, helping them figure out what they would do instead of what I would do. And I thought one big advantage I had was that I had no training whatsoever in psychology when I started. So I was thrown back on, what did I know, right? It's like, here's these girls acting crazy and being hostile and angry and whatnot. And I'm like, well, what do I know how to do? Well, I know how to listen, ask questions, empathize. And turns out those are all the kind of things you need to do to be a good therapist. So that's how I got into the field. And that was back in about 1986. Um, and I had a bunch of different jobs uh, since that time, some in day treatment. I had a great job as a crisis counselor, like uh, mental health crisis line kind of thing. And then I ended up going into a job where I was doing involuntary detention evaluations. And that's where I really discovered what went on like in the bigger mental health world. And I was living in my own little bubble where I'm doing my thing and the people I'm talking to are feeling good and this all seems good. But I started to get to see what happened to people when they went into the hospital. And that's when I started feeling like I can't really continue doing this kind of work because I was seeing what, uh, how the system was treating people. And it was very, very different from what I knew to be helpful. Was that a shock, Steve, to to kind of witness that kind of treatment and what was this, what you thought was a compassionate business? Honestly, it wasn't entirely a shock. I had always been kind of a a maverick uh, from the beginning. Uh, When I first started out that that teen mom some, there was not one person on any kind of of psych medication for anything. It was all, uh, what do they call it, Uh, positive peer culture. We're trying to teach kids to think about things differently, to to create a community with each other, to, you know, we're teaching them Carl Rogers, I statements, all that kind of good stuff. And uh, it had its moments where it felt like it was pretty effective. 
Um, but there was no psych drugs back then. Um, and then when I moved to a, a doing a, a job at a day treatment center, then we started seeing Ritalin show up. Um, there were kids who were on Ritalin and I didn't really see that that was very effective. I had my own views on that kind of thing. So as time went along, I saw more and more and more reliance on psych drugs and less and less on actual human relationships. And that, I think, is what started making me pretty skeptical. Um, but I still kind of felt up to that job. I still kind of felt like I was still doing good things, kind of like, uh, you know, behind enemy lines, as it were. <laughs> I was still able to have some control over the jobs that I had and control of the system. But when I got in that job, it was pretty clear how systematized it was. And honestly, when they went to the hospital, the only thing they gave them was drugs. And they just gave them drugs until either they acted like or said uh, that they were OK now. And then they would send them home. And there seemed to be no concern for their quality of life or what the drugs did to them or didn't do to them. And, you know, the big emphasis on the social workers was to keep the people taking their drugs. That was kind of the thing. So that what that that just kind of pushed me to the point of thinking like this isn't really a salvageable situation. It wasn't stunning to me that it happened, but it just got me to the point of thinking like, man, this is this, th these people aren't doing this because they don't understand that this is how they do business. This is the core of what people do, and I am not, I, I don't do not fit in with this model. Ethically speaking, I felt like I couldn't keep doing this. I understand. And so, you know, what was it then that, that kind of led you towards Madden America? Well, I had always been interested in alternative uh, looks uh, at reality <laughs> of the mental health world. And uh, I started looking at websites. I ran into uh, Mind Freedom. I ran into uh, one called Death by Ritalin or something like that <laughs> and uh, started getting the uh, getting the idea that there was a lot of people being harmed by these things. And um, I think what I, I went to a, uh, yeah, I went to a book lecture at Powell's where Bob showed up and he was talking about his book. And I was just really impressed at that time. Um, and I had joined in also with a group called Rethinking Psychiatry right about that same time in Portland. And that group actually contracted to have Bob come and give a speech, <laughs> give a talk to the to the uh, public. And so I got to know more about about uh, Bob and the book and all that. And it was probably right about that time I started looking at Mad in America. And uh, I really liked the community, especially the thing that struck me most was that it was a space where people who didn't uh, didn't feel the Come, the uh, accepted paradigm was working for them and it was okay for them to say that and speak about that. Thank you, Stephen. So could, could you tell us a little bit about what you do for MIA, what your role is now? Um, I am the moderator for the comment section. I spent a lot of time in the comment section before becoming the moderator. So I actually had some relationships with some of the people who were regulars in there. And so it was a fairly smooth transition for me to take over that role. Um, I retired in 2016 and I was looking for something that was kind of like very part time online where I didn't have to commute or anything. And this just seemed perfect to me. And, and it has been. It's been a wonderful place for me to, to land. Steve, I have to say that I, along with others, think that, you know, moderating the comments is one of the most challenging tasks to do at MIA because there's such a breadth and depth in the discussions. And it, it's a role that requires great skill and tact and diplomacy and you know empathy and you know some of the skills actually you were talking about as a as a being a therapist in your kind of earlier days so you know i really have to pay tribute to how well you do that role and you know it's so difficult to balance so many differing points of view isn't it but you you, you kind of you do it so well well thank you i really appreciate that i have a, i do a second kind of a side job as a a soccer referee and uh the skill sets are similar <laughs> yeah absolutely hopefully not too many red cards in the uh in, in the forums <laughs> so we 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 tend to avoid the red cards every once in a while you gotta throw one out there <laughs> <laughs> 
Absolutely. And and so, Steve, you know, obviously, you, you know, you've been around this world for a while, as you said, you know, you, you have your own experiences based upon what good therapy looks like. And then you kind of came to see what bad therapy and bad psychiatry looks like. And then you're exposed to all the discussions and then became moderator of, of such discussions. So, you know, I, has your uh, view of the mental health landscape or industry has it changed over that time or has it all really just kind of confirmed your suspicions in your early days of getting into this well i i wouldn't say that it's changed my viewpoint on things that uh, uh I, if anything it's solidified just how bad it really is for someone who is stuck in that system and doesn't really have any outside perspective um, and I don't mean to, you know, denigrate people who do use the system and find it helpful. I think that's fantastic for them. And uh, I'm glad they're able to, to make that work. But I think the main problem is you're given a certain story and you're expected to believe that story. And when people start stepping outside of that and saying like, well, you know, you told me this was going to work and it's not working and that people are... You know, honestly, mistreated. They're abused for uh, trying to to figure out what's going to work for them, rather than being treated with some kind of respect. I give you a quick story. When I was on the crisis line, I had this woman call up, and she was frantic. She'd been like for well over a year. She'd been trying different antidepressants, and it just wasn't working. And she was like, "I just, I feel horrible. I feel like there's no hope. I feel like, you know, I tried this and I tried that, and I keep just saying like." Well, just wait. It takes a while, and then we'll try a different one, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I just feel like it's just going to be—I'm just going to be like this forever. So I said to her, "Has anybody ever told you that there are other things you can do for depression besides drugs?" And she's silent for a second. She says, "No." I said, "Well, there are." She says, "Oh, <laughs> well, that's good." <laughs> and so we immediately went into a long discussion of. of various other options that she might have. And I thought, how sad this woman here has been like banging her head against the wall for a year and nobody's ever bothered to tell her, hey, you know what? There's support groups, there's therapy, there's stuff you can read, you know, there's uh, meditation, there's like actions that you can take that actually could help you that don't involve taking drugs. And she had no idea that that was a possibility because that's what she was told. Yeah, absolutely. That's so sad, isn't it? As you say, when the kind of mainstream messaging is just dominated so much by the, you know, psychopharmaceutical complex that people can't, you know, they literally can't see the wood for the trees because it's all the same wood and the same tree, you know, and the benef benefit of Madden America is that it shows a whole forest of other stuff <laughs> that people can look to. Yeah. Exactly. Right, exactly. And people who, you know, there's people who come on who are, uh, you know, positive about their experiences and we have no problem having those people have their voice too but sometimes they get upset when they encounter disagreement from the community however respectful that might happen steve thank you you know before we wrap this up i wondered was there anything else important that you think we should share with people listening well i guess the one thing i would say is that there is even within mia there is this constant sort of tension between the professional person viewpoint and the survivor person viewpoint. And I think that that conflict is central to why the whole system kind of doesn't work. But even with M MIA, you see that, that people get sort of higher marks when they do a blog because they have some credentials, right? And, uh, you know, they're they're sort of like, held as being more credible somehow than the people who are who are just reporting on their own experiences. And some of them have done a tremendous amount of research and know more than a lot of the professionals about what they're talking about, you know. Um, but um, it's that power imbalance there that I think MAA is trying to address, but there's a point at which you, the, the uh, survivors themselves have got to be the driving force to to make this whole thing change. And I think MIA is a great place, and I love the fact that this education happens for people who don't know anything about this. I love the fact that it's a great forum for people who have been harmed by the system to 
talk about what happened to them and how they feel and look into alternatives and that kind of thing. But as long as we have this power imbalance where people who are degreed professionals or whatever get get uh, more credit than the people who are supposedly trying to help, I think I think we're gonna we're gonna keep having this struggle. It's one of the main things I had to address in learning how to be a good therapist. And like I said, I was fortunate I didn't have any training, so I had no sense of that I knew something that these people didn't know. Right? <laughs> but stepping down from that power position and really being willing to listen, it's hard sometimes for professionals to do that I and mean, see people come into the community as professionals and they end up leaving feeling a little battered. But there's a couple like Brett Deacon being an example. There's a couple who have really taken advantage of the experience and have altered their their worldview significantly because of their interactions with the groups. And uh, that's where I think the real answer lies is that people need to just step down from their their power position as professionals and say, hey, you know what, if we want to help these people, maybe we should ask them what's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Who are the experts in the room? The people dealing with the condition, aren't they? The people <laughs> dealing with the treatment and having experienced what harm looks like and what trauma looks yeah. like. And, you know, that's exactly that is the most important position, surely. Sure. And maybe normal is a little bigger thing, a little broader thing than most of the professionals have been brought up to believe. Well, Steve, you know, I, I can't thank you enough for spending a bit of time today to, to talk about the fantastic work you do. And anybody who's visited the kind of discussion comment sections of Madden America can see how lively it is and how, you know, when someone writes a blog from personal experience, how a bit like a, a rugby match, you know, those ideas are, are picked up and carried, aren't they, in the discussions and yeah. whole conversations and threads develop that kind of develop the ideas in the blog. So, you know, I, I think you do a fantastic job of marshalling that and it's really a, a kind of pleasure to see the the discussion almost move in real time well thank you james it is always a pleasure to chat with you for whatever reason and i appreciate you taking the time to listen to what i had to say Next, we hear from Madden America's Family Resources Editor, Miranda Spencer. Miranda joined me to underline why giving parents easy access to alternative information on mental health challenges in kids and youth is so important. Miranda, welcome. Thank you for joining me today uh, for this little podcast to talk about the work of Madden America. And um, to kind of get us underway, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit first about yourself and maybe how you first became aware of Madden America. Yes. Okay. So I had had experience in the mental health system as someone who struggled with anxiety on and off since I was a teenager. And I found a lot of helpfulness going to therapy and such. Um, and then when I was middle aged, I went through a, kind of a personal crisis and I went back to the mental health system and I discovered it had dramatically changed. The emphasis was on just drugs as the first line of treatment and and uh, they were trying to give me diagnoses I'd never had before that were more serious than it seemed warranted and you know the the more I partook of the sort of new mental health system sort of the worse I became and I just said what happened um and I started researching and I came upon a website called Furious Seasons that was written by a journalist who also had mental health issues. And it was chock full of articles and research and books lists and links um, about what's going on in, in the current mental health system and, and with this extreme emphasis on medication and such. And that really opened my eyes and I started you know, reading it every day. And at a certain point, I found out about Robert Whitaker's books and I read Anatomy of an Epidemic and, you know, I really, really opened my eyes. And then um, I guess I found out about the website. I don't think I knew about it until a couple of years after it was created. But, you know, once I did, I started reading it. And then someone that I knew from one of my uh, kind of mental health reform listservs mentioned that they were looking for someone to do freelance journalism. And I wrote to Robert Whitaker and he said, yes, you can do that, but we're actually looking for someone to 
be an editor for our new uh, parent and family resources section. So um, I got the job and, and here I am now. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you, Miranda. And, and you know, I, I mean, great then to move on to talk about, you know, the family resources section of Madden America is such an important part of it, as we know. So can you tell us a little bit about that and the work that you do to, you know, keep that running so well? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I kind of do everything with a lot of of help and coordination uh, with others. Um, Let's see, first thing, it it had already been started, I believe, by a therapist, a critical psychiatry therapist named Eric Maisel was very involved in it. And um, the idea was to kind of help get it further off the ground. And one of the first things we did was create a couple of online parent support groups for parents whose kids were in the mental health system and not liking what they found and looking for alternatives. Um, and to support one another. And so I helped Kermit Cole and Louisa Putnam, um, who are the group leaders, get that off the ground. And also two uh, people in uh, Europe who are on our board, Claudia Esteve and Olga Runciman. So that was one of the first things we did. And then I now uh, help plan the whole site and we and have helped build it up over like about four years that I've been here Um to have blogs, a podcast, Q and A's um, for questions that people might have about kids and mental health and, and psychiatry, um, blogs, a lot of personal stories, videos, town halls. We uh, also cross publish the science, some relevant science news from the main front page, news that is relevant to parent and families uh, from our around the web section, and you know. All the time, we're trying to come up with with new things that might might help people more. So, um, and you know, we take a lot of, and we also just started a newsletter because we're trying to get more feedback from the people we're we're trying to serve. So um, that's just the tip of the iceberg, but. Absolutely, it, it's um, I, you know, it's it's so important. I think for Madden America to have that communication with parents and with young people isn't it because it, it, you know w- with the the soaring rates of young people being diagnosed with all kinds of things and with the rates of prescribing I, I should imagine that parents out there are in a whirlwind of information when they perhaps first come across a diagnosis or, or you know first come across problems with their you know within their families so having somewhere like your section of MIA to go to to try and untangle some of that mess and to try and get some non-mainstream steer that it's incredibly important, isn't it? Yeah, people tend to come to us after they've gone through the mainstream system and, and it hasn't satisfied them and, and harm has come. And so they're they're looking for alternatives. Although I think what I'm hoping is that it will get to the point where people will maybe come to us first and see what all the options are before they decide what to do. Um, I have two little things to add to that. One is that I think there's a real hunger for this type of information. Um particularly concerned about harm because one of the personal stories that um, I assigned, a tragic story of a a couple who lost their daughter uh, based on her being, you know, extremely over-treated over several years in a hospital. And that story got almost more readership than just about anything we've ever published. And to me, that says that, you know, people really want to know and people are very concerned and the other thing that I've got to mention is that we are currently running a teen art um, exhibit where we're soliciting contributions. And I hope anyone that hears this that is a teenager or knows a teenager will encourage them to create any kind of art about their experience in the mental health system and who they feel they are and what they have to say versus what you know adults <laughs> want them to think about themselves. And, and Miranda, in, in the kind of time that you've been doing this work, you know, I, I, I wondered, you know, you, you described yourself at the start how, you know, you, you'd had quite an unsatisfactory journey through the mental health system. And, you know, I wondered with the work that you've done, has your thinking changed any or, you know, has that feeling got stronger or, you know, what, what's your view of the mental health system in the US and, and how we approach, um, you know, perhaps psychological difficulties in our kids? Mm hmm. I could go on for a long time. I mean, there are, I I eventually found wonderful practitioners who were very holistic and compassionate and, you know, helped me dig myself out of, you know, a very deep emotional hole a number of years ago. So they're out there, but it's not the norm, I I find. Um, Sadly, the more I learn about the science, 
um, and the more personal stories I read and, and, and so on, I just think we are really going in the wrong direction that as much as we want to destigmatize mental health issues and make help available to everyone, there's too much emphasis emphasis on pathologizing absolutely everything, drugging absolutely everything. Um, the only good thing is I do see that that is changing. Even the New York Times just the other day has published a series of essays going, well, you know, isn't um, mental illness as much a social problem as it is an individual problem and, and so on. So I think that people are becoming more aware, but it just makes me more committed to the mission of, of Mad in America. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And w- was there anything else, Miranda, that you think we should we should touch on or anything we, we should tell the listeners to look out for in future? I don't know, but I would say if you haven't given the site a good look, you we have a great search function and there's so much information in there. You can go down a wonderful rabbit hole and really, really learn so much about so many different things and so many different options and you know, the message is positive. You know, people are resilient and there is hope. And, you know, you can withdraw from psychiatric drugs if you, if you do it right. You can heal from trauma. You know, um, it's just that the, the way that our current system wants people to do it is one size fits all. And that is not what we need. So, you know, please come to our site and read and think and talk about it. Perfect. Thank you, Miranda. Well, thank you for all the effort you put into the family resources section. You know, I, I've definitely made use of it myself, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's good to know that it's there, I think. So thank you. Sure. So last but not least, I want to thank you for being with us to listen to the podcast this year. Thank you so much for joining us for these interviews, for your comments and for sharing and getting involved. So from all of us at Mad in America, we look forward to joining you again in 2023 for more conversation and discussion. Until then, take care. Thank you for listening to the Mad in America podcast. Visit madinamerica.com for more news, views and updates.